Today we have uh, John Ducci from Stanford uh, presenting. Uh, so John has done a lot of wonderful work in many areas, including privacy, and he's gonna be telling us about private mean estimation. There we go, thank you. All right, well, I'm excited to uh, remotely be here. Uh, it's fun to sort of see a few folks that I haven't seen for a while, hopefully in person sometime soon. Uh, okay, so, so today I'm gonna talk about what is at some level like the simplest uh, task in statistics or or anything, which is estimating a mean. Um, and uh, this is gonna this is this is some work I finished recently with my students Rohit Kudetipudi and Sam and Hack. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna just go ahead and jump in. And please feel free to stop me and ask any questions. And I was telling Thomas I had a few technical issues hooking things up, so I'm presenting things in a slightly different way than I usually do. So. Uh, you know, if things get jumbled, I'm just going to blame the software. Anyway, okay, so the problem in this talk is to estimate a mean. So the game is the following. We have a sample xi of vectors xi, iid from some population p. We have a mean mu in r to the d and a covariance sigma, okay? And all we want to do is estimate this mean mu. Uh, now, the, the trick is, in this talk, I'm going to try to measure error with respect to the norm that my covariance induces. That is to say, we're going to define this Mahalanobis norm, which is this guy right there, uh, where I'm going to measure error in the actual directions of the covariance, just like that. Okay, so I have the inverse covariance measuring my errors. And of course, you know, if, if we don't have any privacy, Classical statistics, I mean, this is like the, the dumbest thing in statistics you could imagine. Classical statistics says, take the sample mean, the expected error of the sample mean for estimating the population mean in uh, the metric that the actual covariance of the data induces is literally exactly the dimension divided by the sample size, right? So this is like the, the simplest thing ever. This is like day one in any statistics class. This is estimating a mean and the mean squared error goes down as dimension divided by sample size. All right, and now the obvious comment here is this sample mean, no matter what your covariance is, the sample mean is adapted to it. So, so uh, I should I should say that you know this error right here is optimal, full stop. You know, even with a constant of one, there as, as in uh, there are lower bounds that say you literally cannot do better than this. The constant is one. You, you, there are many, many ways to formalize this, but essentially D over N is the right rate and you can't do any better. You're never gonna do any better uh, unless something very, very strange happened. Uh, and the nice thing is that no matter what the covariance is, you're going to get this particular rate. Okay, so, so that's the classic statistics thing, no privacy, not a nothing. And the challenge that I wanna talk to, about today is getting my slides to work. Oh, look, there they go. Uh, that in privacy, with differential privacy, there is no similarly efficient and adaptive estimator, no estimator that actually adapts to these covariances, or at least uh, there wasn't until, you know, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Um, all right, so so that's what we're going to do today. Okay, uh, good. So just to recap, uh, this is almost, this is certainly familiar to everyone in this uh, audience, I would assume, but differential privacy uh originally uh, arose in about 2006 this is uh dwork mcsherry and sam smith and then they follow up uh by dwork et al uh to define approximate differential privacy so the setting is we have a sample x of size n and this will just help us set notation for the rest of the talk so uh little x's are going to be vectors always in my sample space so this is in uh basically r to the d times n uh, and I have a randomized mechanism for releasing data. So that's my mechanism M. And we say that this mechanism M is epsilon delta differentially private if for any set A or any measurable set A, if you're in a statistics department, um, I have to say that so they don't kick me out. Uh, otherwise I get in trouble. So for any measurable set A, uh, the probability that the mechanism applied on a given sample X belonging to the set A is less than e to the epsilon times the probability that the mechanism applied on an adjacent sample or an adjacent uh, data set belongs to the same set A plus this little additive error delta. Um, and so the basic game is that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, if, if, if two collections of, of people differ on only the last individual, then uh, nothing downstream can kind of distinguish based on the output of your mechanism, whether the original data set was X or X prime. Uh, said differently, 
Uh, and this is this is a way I kind of like to think about it personally, but you know, doesn't doesn't really matter. These are all equivalent, more or less. Uh, any test that you could imagine developing of whether the data is actually x or x prime based on the outputs of this mechanism m of x, the probability of it having a type one error, that is to say, a false positive, plus the probability of it having a type two error, that is to say, a false negative, is at least basically two over one plus e to the epsilon minus delta, all right? And, and a slight, I mean, this, this is a consequence of this definition, but there's a slight tweak that makes this, uh, this inequality and this inequality completely equivalent. Uh, I'm not gonna worry about exactly the precise definitions, but basically you should think of the probability of making a mistake in testing downstream, whether you had x or x prime is nearly random guessing, 50-50. Okay, so we're all familiar with that, I assume. Okay, so jumping on, so, so what are the standard sort of mechanisms in differential privacy? Because, and, and the reason I'm going over these, and I understand that these are classic and basic things, uh, here, the reason I want to go over these is because basically we're going to keep just keep using them throughout this talk. So the basic mechanism, the, the sort of most classical mechanism in differential privacy is called the Laplace mechanism. And this has been around for 16, 17 years now. And so we have a function f that takes inputs in our sample space and spits out, say, a real number. We want to estimate it. And we say that it has what's called global sensitivity, or you might call this the Lipschitz constant of uh, gs, which is the, the most the function f can change when I change uh, one element in my, its inputs. So as long as f doesn't change very much, then uh, the sensitivity is low. And then the Laplace mechanism just says, OK, to, a good mechanism is to take your function f uh, and add noise, kind of whose, whose variance, actually whose, whose standard deviation, scales kind of commensurately with this global sensitivity. That's the entire game. And so that basically covers up uh, this guarantees differential privacy and covers up any kind of information you might leak. All right, and uh, you know, normally when I give this talk, it's not to a collection of experts in the audience, and so sometimes I like to just prove that this guarantees differential privacy, but it's the proof is fairly trivial. Uh, the utility of this mechanism is, of course, the expected mean squared error is literally just the variance of global sensitivity divided by epsilon of a Laplace one random variable, which is of course just equal to global sensitivity squared by epsilon squared. Okay, and so Wait, your mean squared error. Shouldn't there be a factor of two in there? What's that? Shouldn't there be a factor of two in there? Yeah, probably, sure. We can put some twos here. You know what, we can make it even more correct. We could just say it's like less than or equal to four because I never remember if there's twos or fours or, you know, something like that. Then this this way we're guaranteed to be correct. Uh, <laughs> I, in this talk, you know, I, I will say a priori, you know, I'm going to have numerical constants floating around in this talk, and they're going to be big. Uh, they're going to be so big that unfortunately, no algorithm I talk about will be practical. But we we might get there someday. Uh, I have hope. Okay. Anyway, but the point is that you know, the smaller your sensitivity is, you know, the less your function can change on a changing of an input the better accuracy you can get. Okay, so that, that's just the game here. Okay, so a slightly more sophisticated uh, mechanism, let's change the page, there you go, sorry about that, is the Gaussian mechanism. And so this, this is what's gonna kind of be central to us. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is that here, now we're going to try to be estimating or outputting a, uh, a function whose outputs are in R to the D, okay? Uh, and we're going to change the definition of global sensitivity slightly. So before, global sensitivity was with respect to sort of absolute changes in F. Now, let's keep going. There we are. It's going to be respect to the L2 norm. So, so I'm thinking of outputting vectors like a d-dimensional mean or something like that. Now, the global sensitivity, uh, you know, my function F only changes by some amount gs when I change a single example between x and x prime. All right, and then the standard mechanism in this case is the Gaussian mechanism. And this mechanism is uh, epsilon differential, sorry, excuse me. We've now uh, moved away from epsilon differential privacy and we're doing approximate differential privacy now. So if we add noise, Gaussian noise now, 
whose variance is commensurate with sort of this global sensitivity squared divided by epsilon squared times a logarithmic penalty in the delta privacy parameter, basically the probability that these mechanisms just kind of grossly fail. When we add noise like this, then the expected error in the output of our mechanism X minus the true function F that I actually want to output is exactly just the variance of our Gaussian. And there we multiply by D because this is an identity D covariance. So there's a sort of a dimension dependent penalty we have to pay as well. And uh, this scaling with dimension and privacy parameter and everything is minimax optimal. And that's a result due to Thomas and uh, his collaborator, John Ullman. Is that correct, jo Thomas? Yeah, good. This, so this is, you know, I mean, the up, to, up to numerical constants, this is about as good as you could possibly do. All right. At least in some worst case sense. OK. All right. Um, any questions on the setting, kind of the basic stuff so far? This is probably familiar to many of you. OK, everybody's happy. Sounds good. OK, so, so these are kind of the basic mechanisms. Now let's talk a, a, a tiny bit more. I'd like to dig in a little bit to what we do when we want to estimate a one-dimensional mean. And you say, John, this is pretty simple. Yeah, so far it is. But, but these building blocks are going to be kind of nice. So let's start by saying, suppose my data all lies in between minus 1 and 1. OK, so, so here's minus 1, here's 1, and everything in my sample space is on that uh, in that interval, all right? Then clearly, the most I can change the mean of n data points is to take a data point that was at minus 1, move it all the way over to plus 1. And so that changes the sample mean uh, by at most 2 over n, right? No way I can change any more than that. And so if I wanted to release the mean, or the sample mean of a, of a data set, as long as the data were bounded between minus 1 and 1, then the global sensitivity is 2 over n. I add noise whose variance sort of scales uh, as commensurate with this global sensitivity. And then for any of my standard mechanisms, I just, you know, which is to say I, I release x bar n plus uh, 2 over n times Laplace 1 random variable, sorry, 2 over n epsilon. And then my mean squared error is at most order 1 divided by n squared epsilon squared. Okay, So that's good. If the data is all bounded, we're in good shape. Life is good. Now, when the data is unbounded, we have to do something a little bit more clever. Okay, So suppose my data could be completely unbounded. You know, It could be anywhere on the real line, even in one dimension. Now, in this case, naively, you know, I could take a data point, say, here. Oopsie. Sorry. And move it all the way you know, I mean, over up to plus infinity or something like that. And I can change a sample mean completely arbitrarily by moving one data point. Now, we don't want to do that. And so what we do is we truncate the data and say, listen, you're not actually allowed to do that. There we go. Like I said, I, I, I'm using new technology to me on my iPad. Uh, so, so we truncate the mean. You pick some kind of range B and say, all right, all the data, I'm going to just force it to lie in between minus B and B. Let's call this 2B now just to make things actually correct. There we go. Uh, and once I do that, I can no longer just move a data point completely arbitrarily. Right? I can only move it. OK, there's no, there's no eraser in Keynote. I apologize. I can only move it, say, from minus B to B. And so in this case, the global sensitivity now is going to be exactly to be on n. And if I apply my standard Laplace or Gaussian mechanism, <clears throat> excuse me, then the it turns out you can do a little calculation to see that the expected mean squared error of basically releasing uh, 1 on n, sum i equals 1 to n, and then the basically the projection of xi into minus b to b. So here I, uh oh, sorry. Right here I mean that this means just take xi, and if it's bigger than b, project it down to b. And if it's smaller than negative b, project it to minus b. So if I take this truncated sample mean and then add basically Laplace or Gaussian noise of uh, an appropriate scale, which scales exactly as this truncation parameter, then this mechanism achieves an error which scales as b squared divided by n squared plus 1 over b to the 2p minus 2, where this this uh, this moment bound here 
it depends on basically what I know, what prior information I have about my data matrix or uh, about my data X, how many moments it has. Okay. And, and this is a quick calculation that uh, I'm not going to get into. And, and if you optimize for this, you can choose a, 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 an optimal B here, basically by setting these two terms equal. And roughly what you get is a minimax error scaling as something like one on n squared epsilon squared to the p minus one over p. Okay, so so even in one dimension, as soon as you don't have an a priori guarantee on a boundedness of your data, you actually have to be a bit clever and start truncating things. Okay, and and your rates of convergence change, your estimators change. You have to do some more clever things. Okay. All right, so in D dimensions, things are a little bit more sophisticated. All right, so let's start by what, what I might call like a naive case. So this is, this is just sort of saying, okay, I have data, uh, it's bounded in an L2 ball of some radius, and I'm gonna just fix the radius to be square root D in this case, because um, intuitively, you know, why, do we, why am I saying square root D is the radius of my data? Well, if the covariance of my data, let's just say for, kicks the covariance of my data is the identity, then of course, expectation of the two norm squared of X is equal to the dimension. Uh, and we always have that the expectation of a random vector X with respect to, oopsie, sorry, its own covariance is literally equal to the dimension. And so sort of this, this dimension scaling on the L2 norm of X is about the right scale, at least when we're thinking about covariances. Okay, so, so the data is bounded in a ball it's a radius square root D, roughly. Then the global sensitivity here, how much could I actually change a sample mean? Well, I could take this point right there. I can move it all the way across my sphere. And so the most I'm gonna change things is by exactly this amount, square root D divided by N because we're taking a sample mean, all right? So in this case, you know, a standard Gaussian mechanism, which adds Gaussian noise with variance, basically dimension over sample size squared uh, is going to give us this minimax optimal utility of the expected error of the mechanism minus the population mean is d over n this is an unavoidable statistical error plus a privacy penalty which looks like d squared log one on delta divided by n squared and this is both of these are uh minimax optimal okay so neither of these is 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 improvable all right, and now with all this said, so what we'd like to do now is actually is to start trying to get estimation to be adaptive to the co covariance, all right? And so, so when I say we'd like to do this, what I mean is that the, the, the target here will be, suppose I get a sample IID from this population P with mean EX and covariance sigma, then what I'd like to develop is a private mechanism, I'll call that mu tilde, that with high probability gives something like uh, so this is mu tilde minus, oops, see, sorry, the true mean transpose sigma inverse times mu tilde minus the true mean, which is just this, let's, there we go, which is just this value here, that this scales is something like D over N, where that's the statistical efficiency. So this is unavoidable. This is statistical error. Plus I'm writing O tilde one here. This is going to hide a bunch of logarithmic factors, typically logarithmic in n, the sample size, and d, the dimension. Uh, that so that with high probability, I basically get this times d squared by n squared epsilon squared, and this is the minimax privacy lower bound. So you can't achieve any better than this. So we want to achieve both of these things simultaneously. So that's going to be the goal today: is can we get this without knowing this covariance ahead of time? Okay. Um, Great. Oops, sorry. All right. So, so, so to, to understand this a little bit, let's suppose that I knew roughly uh, where the mean of my data was. You know, so I know somehow like the mean of the data is somewhere near here, and I had a, and I actually knew what the covariance is. So, so call this uh, ellipse right here. This is going to be the ellipse of points. Uh, whose di distance from like the true population mean mu is basically the square root of the dimension measured with respect to this covariance here. All right, so, so what you should be thinking is, you know, in this direction, the data has a lot of variance and in this direction, the data has not so much variance. And we see that most of the data is in 
this ellipse. And so the simplest thing to do is just to say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove all the data outside of the covariance ball. Bam, bam, bam. It's gone because it shouldn't affect the mean very much. And then, you know, sort of essentially now I can just apply the previous, whoopsie, where are we? Apply the previous ideas, you know, just estimate a sample mean, pretending it's inside a ball. Boop, boop, boom. And uh, its sensitivity is going to be exactly d over n squared because the radius of this ellipse is uh, square root d. So I eliminate these guys. I add Gaussian noise, just the standard Gaussian noise. But now I add noise with the covariance, reflective of the covariance that I know is the true covariance. And then this has exactly the utilities I, but exactly the utility guarantees that I would like. So if I could add, excuse me, if I could, if I knew the covariance ahead of time sigma, and I could truncate my data so that anything far enough, too far away from the mean with respect to this appropriate covariance measure just gets thrown away because I say, you're too weird, go away point. Then a really simple mechanism of just adding Gaussian noise, whose covariance is sigma and who's uh, multiplied by this kind of dimension dependent privacy dependent penalty. Oops, there's supposed to be an epsilon squared here. If I could do this, then I'd be in good shape. Right. So, so if we knew all these things ahead of time, we'd be we'd be in tall cotton. We don't know these things ahead of time. That's going to be a challenge. All right. Okay. So, so with this, there's a really nice, uh, you know, a, a different approach, assuming that the covariance was the identity, but we want don't know the sort of scale of our data. Then there's a, a nice paper called Coin Press by Biswas Dong, Kamath, and John Ullman as well. Um, and, and here the idea is, okay, we're going to just assume the data has identity covariance. We just don't know how, how kind of, how big the data set is or how, how sort of what, what's the diameter of the data, how far apart should the points be? All right. And so all they do, not, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say all they do. What they do is they repeatedly estimate the mean of your sample. They find some kind of scale where most of the data is inside a particular region. They truncate all of the data in to be actually to force it to be in that region and then they repeat okay and so they just iterate this and you you can see we've removed this data point we iterate again we remove these guys and eventually we kind of get to this point and this is of course just an illustration but we get to this point where the scale of the data is is about correct all right and so this is delightfully practical it actually works really really well in practice one challenge is that if you have it, it has to assume that the covariance of your data is the identity or something close to the identity maybe i should say uh sorry i should say like it's sort of approximately a scaled multiple of the identity matrix all right because it, and if the data is sort of highly skewed you know if instead of looking like these circles you had data that was somehow this weird elliptical shape these methods start to break down a little bit okay so so while they are delightfully practical, they work super well. Uh, they adapt to the scale of your data. They can't kind of handle weird sort of, I don't know, non-spherical covariances. OK, so all right, so what are we going to do? Um, what we're going to do is adapt this idea that's been floating around in the literature for a little while. Um, it's kind of like the proposed test release framework. This is sort of uh, an idea. I don't know. I, I trace it back to Dwork and Lay. Who had a nice paper on robustness and differential privacy. Um, more recently, Brown et al., Lu et al., so Si Wong has been involved in some papers kind of building on these ideas where you sort of pre uh, pretend, like basically you, you uh, how do I want to describe this? You find sufficient conditions so that your data set has most of its data kind of near some appropriate place, and then you just kind of enforce that. And, and typically this is sort of computationally hard, but the idea is that if you get a good data set, most of the data is near the mean. So in this case, you know, so we'll call it a collection of good data sets to be all collections of endpoints in R to the D, where the distance between an individual data point and the sample mean is less than some constant B. And here, note I am measuring things with respect to sigma n is the actual covariance of the data. So sum i equals one to n of xi, xi transpose. Actually. Not that exactly. Xi, oh, Xi transpose minus X bar n, X bar n transpose. Okay, so that's the sample covariance. 
So if we if we could be guaranteed somehow that we had a good data set, um, you know, we could we could implement what's called the proposed test released framework. All right. So what we're going to do. So so this is all sort of a comp we're not going to worry about computational efficiency or anything like that. Is we're going to ask, okay, if I were given a sample, how many observations would I have to change to take my sample, which may or may not be good? and make it so that it's actually a good data set, meaning that each, say, uh, each observation xi is close to the sample mean measured with respect to these sample covariance. And so in this case, you know, this in my little sort of figure here, this is basically two. I would have to take this data point and move it inside this ellipse, take this data point, move it inside this ellipse. And we see that in this case, the Hamming distance between my sample and like the collection of good data sets where most of the data is well-behaved is about two. All right, so based on this intuition, yeah, you know, I can actually develop a, uh, a statistic, sorry, take one step back. This distance, the distance between a uh, sample and the collection of good data sets is a one Lipschitz function of the data set, because obviously if I change one example in the XIs, I can always just change it back to another example. And so this is sort of smooth in the underlying collection of data sets. So if we just add Laplace noise scaling as one on epsilon, this statistic T is a private statistic. Okay, so here's my moving the data points into the, the circle and making myself a good data set. So with this, you know, one natural choice of things to do is to say, okay, listen, if T is small, so I can actually privately test if T is small, meaning my data set is close to the collection of good data sets, then I could project my data. So that's X. I could project it onto the collection of good data sets. I get a new collection of points Z, which are like the corrected data. And then I simply take a sample mean and add Gaussian noise to this, all right? And uh, via some a, a bunch of clever math and things like this, you can actually show, oopsie, Sorry, I'm trying to get my uh, slides back here. You can actually show that this is gonna, gonna work. And this guarantees if you could actually do this, this would actually be sufficient to guarantee privacy and reasonable accuracy. All right, and so uh, a theorem by Gavin Brown and some collaborators, I've, I'm sorry, there are like six authors on this paper and I've forgotten the other five. Um, it's plausible that Thomas is on this, I don't even remember. You're not on this. Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> that this sort of idea of this test project release framework, where one basically adds Gaussian noise to a projected sample mean, it gets both accuracy. Uh, so in their paper, they assume that the data are actually Gaussian, and this covariance sigma is full rank. It gets accuracy, uh, and it is always epsilon de delta differentially private. So you can actually implement no, sorry, let me rephrase this. If you could implement this, it would be epsilon delta differentially private, and it would have reasonable accuracy, at least for sort of uh, some families of distributions. Okay, and there's more recent work that's improved on this. Okay, so what we'd like to do is kind of take this idea of projecting to collections of good data sets and then releasing just a noisy sample mean and try to make this computationally efficient and actually also give us sort of, sort of some optimal dependence on privacy parameters. All right, so that's going to be what we're going to do. All right, so, but like I said, you know, there are a few issues with uh, what I've described so far, and and at least until um, a couple months ago, basically these algorithms were exponential time, or uh, you could get them to actually be roughly polynomial time, but then you had to assume that your data were actually Gaussian. And uh, something I like to tell my students is that Gaussians don't actually exist. So this is sort of a, a bit of a strong assumption. Anyway, they exist uh, asymptotically, but nowhere do we actually have a sample of uh, an infinite size. Okay, anyway, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these ideas and do this two-phase approach. So we're going to jump, use this Brown et al. paper as a jumping off point and have this two-phase approach where we basically just try to get some kind of reasonable proxy for the covariance, Then I'm going to try to stably estimate the mean. And so step one, this is a two-step process, estimate the covariance, step two, add Gaussian noise with this estimated covariance, but I'm going to do it to this kind of projected or trimmed down mean. That's going to be it. All right. 
Oh, and the key is that I never actually release this because if I had to actually release this covariance, well, now I'm re now I'd have to release some kind of high dimensional object, and I would just destroy all my privacy guarantees. I'd be monkeyed. So I'm not going to do that. All right. So here's our two phase approach. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated algorithm, but hopefully I can draw a few pictures as we do this, and it'll be a bit clearer what we're going, what we're doing. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run this goofy for loop where I'm going to start off by taking my sample covariance, and I, I write it this way as xi minus uh, xn over 2 plus i. Basically, I just look at paired differences of my x's rather than uh, sample mean difference because it's co computationally more, or sorry, it's more analytically tractable. But anyway, this is the initial sample covariance. So I start with my initial sample covariance, and I get a bunch of iid Laplacian random variables. All right, And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to iteratively remove elements from this sample covariance. And once I I'm going to go through this for loop kind of testing if if particular uh, paired observations look weird. I'm going to remove all the weird ones, and I can only shrink this covariance over time. And eventually, I'm going to stop removing things. And then I'm going to just stop. I'm going to call it a day, and that'll be done. So how does this actually work? Basically, I think I can draw pictures here. Yeah, I can. Great. OK, so I'm going to loop through, and I'm going to look at these indices. So I'm going to pick a pair say these two indices, all right? So I pick this pair, and if these are far apart relative to what I believe my current covariance to be, meaning that they are large relative to kind of this exponentiated difference of Laplace random variables, then, so I, I run this test, if they're too far apart, I just remove them. Now, if I look at this pair right here with this red line between them, they're actually quite close in the metric that the covariance induces, even though they're out here, you know, they're they're not actually that far apart because I could move them, say, here and they'd be smack dab in the middle. Okay, so those those two actually look somehow the distance between these or their 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 kind of vector between them looks like the rest of the data. That's kind of commensurate with the rest of the covariance. We're not going to remove them. Okay. But uh, if I looked at say this pair, this pair is very far apart relative to what I think the data should look like. And so I'm going to just remove it from the data set. And I have this collection R of removed indices that I keep building up. And I re-estimate my covariance at the end of every loop. And you can see that all I'm, I'm just going to keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And eventually, well, either I'm going to have removed everything or I'm going to just stop because I don't remove anything new. All right. And so we kind of shrink down these indices. And this is this type of procedure should be a little bit familiar from like various flavors of robust estimation and things like this. We couldn't find an exact analog, but we, we think there might be connections that we don't. Uh, totally grok. So anyway, so we're going to just iteratively loop through and, excuse me, so we've removed these two indices. They're gone. We shrink the covariance. We do another test. And now here in this figure, you know, all pairs of points look close enough relative to the covariance we've estimated. We call it a day. We say, okay, everything actually looks sort of consistent with the covariance being something like this. And now we stop. Okay, so this is our stable covariance estimation procedure. Oh, Sorry, somebody raised the hand. Yeah, uh, Abradif here. Hey, John. Oh, hey, Abradif. Hey, uh, so uh, this, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this paper. There's a paper with Pratik Jain we wrote last cold for robust linear, uh, I mean, private linear regression. And we were essentially getting this kind of improvement from d to the power of three half to d. And the ideas were like fairly similar in the sense like you are doing linear regression and at each step you just prune out like weird looking points by some version of point point press. Mm. So I just wanted to make a comment on that. I'm still not sure how it relates directly to mean estimation, but seems like some relation is there. I don't know. Yes, I, I think you know, so so two things in response to that. One, um the first response is absolutely this is related to many, many things in the literature, and I don't have uh, appropriate collections of citations right here. And I'm also confident that we've missed many papers because there are a lot of papers out there, it turns out, uh, to keep track of. But um, you know, this idea of kind of pruning indices is definitely, I mean, certainly it's there in like the robust mean estimation literature where you're trying to kind of figure out, oh, make sure that you, know, you want to be robust to adversarial uh, contamination. So this, these sort of flavors of ideas where we iteratively prune things out and, and these kind of iterative pruning procedures being what gets us to computational efficiency, 
are there. And we've taken inspiration from like 16 different papers. So, so and, you're, and everybody, yours might even be one of them. I can't even remember, I'm sorry. No worries. I, I mean, the, it was more of a question because I the relation between linear regression and mean estimation seems superficially similar, but somehow uh, Pratik and I tried to get those ideas to work in the mean estimation and it did not work that way. So this was more of a question rather than a... Yeah, yeah. So I don't... I mean, okay, you know, I don't... It's hard for me to say exactly what the secret sauce insight is in what we've done. I should also say, and I, I should have said this earlier, and I apologize, um, but uh, there's a paper by Gavin Brown, Sam Hopkins, and Adam Smith, who who developed a very, very similar algorithm to ours, and they basically do almost identical things. Um, their paper came out like a week after ours or something like that on the archive. So, so there's the, the, these sort of ideas are not, you know, we are not uniquely the, the typical come, to come up with them. But I think roughly in the analysis that our, our key idea is roughly that somehow we have this global Laplace noise Z0 that centers all of the, the, all of the Laplace noises that we are adding. And somehow that lets us do a coupling of algorithms to say that given two adjacent data sets, x, x prime, say, I can slightly modify my noise variable z to guarantee that I remove the same indices across both of them. I can basically get algorithms to perform identically. And somehow, this is the magic secret sauce in these analyses for us. Now, I don't know how that reflects. I don't know how that relates to. And it's kind of very similar with it. We were in the linear regression case. We are just taking the linear regression loss of the right. data point of the current model, adding the plus noise and checking whether it is too weird or not. If it is weird, just cut it out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this, this as I said, you know, this idea is definitely there. Thomas, sorry. Um, so one one question I had is you're you're removing the indices where That's a lot of the time we would do clipping instead. Is there like a fundamental reason for doing it no. that way? Uh the 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 reason is this is what we could analyze. Sure. Okay. Um I think you know one 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 thing, at least in terms of our analysis, that was useful is you'll notice that we are consistently normalizing the covariance by one over n here, which is plausibly just an artifact of the analysis. But it means that the covariance is constantly shrinking, which means that these terms are constantly growing. So so points just get weirder and weirder as our algorithm iterates. And so by the time we finish, we're really guaranteed that they're all nice. Um, but hard, it's a little hard for me to say. You know, we should we shouldn't be truncating them or something like that. It's just removing them completely was much easier to analyze because we never once a point was gone, it was gone forever. We said thank you, goodbye. Yeah, um, makes sense. But yeah, I think. Well, well. Anyway, you, you'll you'll notice that there are no experiments in this talk. Um, by the end, you might notice that, and and there's a reason for that, which is that. You know, my students and I, we actually did implement it. And, and it sort of seemed like in dimension five, by the time the sample size was somewhere near 100,000, this sort of seemed to start working. Um, but <laughs> practicality isn't there yet. Uh, OK, sorry. So this is the this is the covariance estimation bit. Um, and as you guys are pointing out, you know, this is very related to a bunch of similar techniques floating around in the literature. And, and somehow we managed to put the pieces together the right way to get the constants to work out. Uh, okay, so so then part two of the algorithm is going to be stable mean estimation, and so so part one, you know, we we somehow get a reasonable estimate of the covariance that's removed all of the cruft, or at least a lot of the cruft. Part two is we want to get a good mean estimator, uh, or a stable mean estimator, and so if we're given a putative covariance, so this is like I guess that this is the covariance. I'm just calling it A for now. It's just some positive definite matrix. Uh, I'm going to consider kind of collections of indices and any of those that are too big relative to A, I say, hey, these guys are way too far apart and I'm going to kick them out. And then I'm going to add a bunch of noise to the results. So, so let's say I have this random partition of indices. So in this case, I have groups one through three, blue, marigold, and salmon colored, I think. Um, and then what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, okay, what's the diameter of these different sets of indices? You know, so the, the salmon or the pink indices are fairly small. So they're very close together. They don't look too weird. On the other hand, the blue indices look super weird. And so I'm going to just remove all of them. All right. So basically, you know, for each subset S, 
So oh, sorry, ZS here is just a Laplace random variable, one on epsilon as usual. Um, for each subset S, I look at the diameter of that subset with respect to my kind of putative or guessed covariance A. And if it's too large, you know, relative to some kind of Laplacian noise, then I just completely remove that data set from, or sorry, that subset of points from the collection of examples. So uh, in this case, we take our blue examples. I ask, is there any version of the covariance in which they would fit? The answer is no. And so I remove all of them. Now, on the other hand, the yellow ones, they do fit in a ball that the covariance defines, so they're good. Same with the pink ones. I remove the blue ones. You can see they disappeared. And as long as I don't have to remove too many indices, I just release a sample mean kind of perturbed by Gaussian noise whose, whose variance is exactly this estimated covariance of my data. All right. And that's, that's the algorithm right there. I, I've literally described the algorithm, except that these constants CI have completely unspecified. Okay, and so, so that's the game. And uh, there's basically four steps in this analysis, which I'm not going to go through the super deep details, but I will tell you about the building blocks. Basically, the game is the following. If I have two adjacent samples, X and X prime, I'm going to say that, I, I apologize, I'm jumping all over the place. I'm going to say that two random variables, x and y, are epsilon delta close in distribution. So that's this symbol up here. If and only if they are basically, basically they satisfy the usual epsilon delta privacy, differential privacy guarantees. It's just going to be convenient for writing things out because we'll get equalities. OK, so, so the game is that if I have two adjacent samples, what we do is pr uh, prove, whoopsie, sorry. We prove four things. Um, and, and the key building blocks are first that basically if I if I think about running my algorithm, okay, and I have R the collection of indices I've removed in covariance estimation. So you remember we start removing indices, we pair them off as they look weird throughout the estimation. Then if I define my estimated covariance that I actually wanted to that I actually computed. And the estimated covariance where I remove this ith example if it was in the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I ask, I have my estimated covariance and then I remove example i uh, if I didn't, this is, this is super redundant. So if the, ex if, if index i is not in the collection of removed indices, I can ask how much would my estimated covariance change? And the answer is not much. Basically, the covariance is stable to perturbations of uh, removing an example as long as the algorithm itself didn't say to remove the example or that the example is weird. So all of the non-weird examples that remain in, the covariance itself is extremely stable. So maybe I should say it like that. Covariance is stable to removal of nice data points, where nice just means that my covariance, my, my covariance uh, paring down algorithm didn't remove the index. OK. Uh, and then the second component is that if I have inputs x and x prime, and r prime is the collection of removed indices on x prime, then these two collections of removed indices, uh, this is actually not completely accurate, this set minus the index i and this guy without the index i, where we're saying that x and x prime are adjacent samples, where x except for i is equal to x except for i prime. That the sets of removed indices, except for this if weird if changed example, are basically extremely close to each other. Okay, and then the last little bits and pieces are just things about adding Gaussian noise to uh, sample means, which are that if uh, if two putative covariances A and B are close together, basically like one on n apart, these are the same thing, then adding noise to a sample mean keeps me with differential privacy. And then I can also say that for any covariance matrix A, that I can change a single example x and x prime, and my stable mean estimation procedure is epsilon delta differentially private. Okay, and then once we've got these, then we just uh, we just write a little bit of transitive thing, you know. So I start off and I ask, okay, mu tilde of x and sigma hat. Well, this is going to be epsilon delta close to 
mu tilde with respect to x and sigma hat, except I removed the example x minus i. Okay, but, oops, and sorry, these are minus i. But I know because sigma hat accepting its ith example here, this guy, this is basically going to be equal, at least up to epsilon delta, to sigma hat prime with its ith example removed, just because of this condition, that the sets of removed indices are completely identical. And once the sets of removed indices are identical, then these two matrices are basically the same. Okay, once I have that, okay, then this says that I am epsilon delta close to mu tilde, except I apply it to x and sigma hat prime minus i. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I can, I apologize. I can go back and say that this is going to be epsilon delta close to mu tilde applied to x with sigma hat prime. And that's again, just by applying this lemma because sigma hat and sigma hat minus i are very close. Uh, and then now I know I can switch one example based on this lemma right here. So that is this guy. Okay, so we just basically get a bunch of equalities from our little building blocks that uh, the sets of removed indices are similar, that the covariances don't change as long as the indices aren't weird, and adding noise commensurate to, excuse me, when I add noise with respect to a certain covariance in my sample mean estimation, then things don't change much. And that's it. And so we can state our final theorem. Oop, or sorry, I can state my privacy theorem. It says, let's let mu tilde be the output of my stable mean procedure along with some input covariance sigma hat, which is estimated by the stable covariance procedure. And as long as the sample size is large enough, we'll talk about this again in a little bit, then mu tilde is actually epsilon delta differentially private. Okay, so, so as long as you have a large enough sample size, you have differential privacy. Uh, I was gonna do proof sketch, but that seems boring. So. Let me talk about accuracy, and then I'm going to go back a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about the various conditions that I've assumed. So the accuracy guarantee are, suppose that mu tilde is the output of the stable mean procedure with this given random covariance, as before. And now, what I'm going to assume is that I have some bound m squared, where with high probability, uh, the maximum distance between a di given data point and the population mean is at most m squared. Okay, and so you should think of this, this is approximately like D plus log N if the Xi are sub-Gaussian. All right, so that's, that's basically what you should think of M being. Then as soon as you have this, uh, then this, this algorithm I've described basically can guarantee that your, your, the, the error between your estimated mean, mu tilde, and the true population mean mu scales as at most d over n plus whatever this maximum error is times d log squared one on delta divided by n squared epsilon squared right and then you get the corollary that if the data are sub gaussian you get this okay so do you have to yes, know sir. m do i have to know m great question uh did i put this nope uh, i didn't put that slide in uh no you do not have to know ah sorry you do not have to know m uh, we do have, we have an adaptive procedure that can, that basically, uh, basically what it does is it runs our procedure with a guessed value of M. Okay. And if you reject too many indices, so you can, re you can release privately how many indices you reject because that's going to be stable to changes of one input switch. And you add some Laplacian noise and you can release the number of indices you've rejected or tossed out as being too weird. If you rejected too many, you double M, keep going. If you kept all of them, you have M and shrink down. Okay, and this with high probability gets you the right size and you pay a log factor. Okay, and there's there's analysis in the paper. So, so do you have to know M? Uh, in theory, no, <laughs> is, is the answer there. Um, okay, so, so let me make a couple of comments about this accuracy guarantee and this privacy guarantee before going on. So. Uh, one thing is we have this log squared penalty here. This is suboptimal. 
And so it's off by a factor of log one on delta. We don't know how to fix that. So we have an extra log factor floating around. Um, previous work had like a log to the sixth, so I'm not super worried about it, but uh, you know, it's wrong. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not sharp. You could shoot, someone should be able to improve this. Uh, the other condition that I wanna mention briefly. So, so just looking at this scaling, ignoring log factors, I've got D squared on N squared, oops, sorry n squared epsilon squared plus d on n as my final error. Okay, so we've got these two errors. Um, if we look back at our condition for privacy, I had to assume that the sample size n was larger than d on epsilon squared times log squared one on delta. Okay, so if I think about the error in my algorithm, what this is saying is basically that the statistical error, so D over N, this is what comes from statistics. This is dominating uh, the privacy penalty, the private, the penalty you have to pay from privacy. Because I'm, I mean, basically, uh, if I look at this condition, this is completely equivalent, ignoring this log factor to, uh, excuse me, epsilon squared being bigger than or equal to D on N, which is equivalent to D squared divided by n squared epsilon squared being less than or equal to d on n. That is to say one is bigger than d on n epsilon squared. And so I multiply both sides of this by d over n. Okay, and so somehow we unfortunately are requiring a sample size which is so large that the private penalty is dominated by the sort of statistical error in the problem. This is actually consistent across most of the papers that I know for mean estimation is somehow they only appear to work, at least the analyses only go through when the sample sizes are large enough that the statistical error dominates the privacy error. And so this is kind of an open question. I don't know how to deal with this right now. And um, I mentioned the paper by Brown, Hopkins, and Smith that does similar things to us, and I believe they have the same issue. So if anybody has any thoughts there, I'm all ears. Uh, okay, and with that, I think uh, maybe I can just state some conclusions. We can call it at least for the talk. Um, sorry, give me the conclusions. That we have this polynomial time. Sorry, again, technical issues. There we go. Okay, so I have this polynomial time algorithm, uh, which is adapted to the covariance and up to logarithmic factors. It's got minimax optimal covariance dependence. The algorithm, unfortunately, while it is fast, you can implement it pretty quickly, is not completely practical because there are these numerical constants floating around that are like, you know, log n or 10 times log n or something like that. And uh, it makes it not actually work so hot in practice. And so this is something we really need to nail down. Um, we can adapt to data with fewer moments. So even if your data is not, say, like sub Gaussian, you know, you just have three moments, four moments, or, uh, you can develop an adaptive version of this procedure. Uh, it's a bit subtle and here we're not and, and when i say a bit subtle what i mean is it's not minimax optimal anymore <laughs> all right and uh now there are a number of connections between robustness differential privacy uh that we haven't really touched on but i think that these plausibly allow for a lot of opportunities for practical and theoretical advances and uh anyway so i'll call it a day here Recall out a talk here, and I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. So thanks a bunch for your attention.